Hi everyone. Um, is this thing working? It is. Great. Um, so, for those who know me, I'm one of the co organizers of the Kubernetes Meetup uh, with Vincent. Um, and so, I haven't really given a talk in quite a while, it, neither has Vincent. We've been, uh, thankfully, been inundated with a lot of people we've been talking. So, we thought it's about time that we actually give a bit of a talk back as well. But um, so, just quickly, um, the stickers that Wesley was handing out are kindly provided by Twistlock. So I um, will try and hand out a few as I go through my talk as well. Um, if uh, anyone has any questions on Kubernetes security as I go through, please raise your hand and ask. Um, this is a talk, and I don't know if, actually let's first start off with just a bit of hands. How many people saw the CNCF blog that came out probably about a week ago, I think? on Kubernetes security. <laughs> this guy always puts his hand up. Um, there was quite an interesting blog that does cover a lot of important parts of Kubernetes. This talk will probably cover a lot of those things as well. So if you've read the blog, then you can probably take a bit of a walk around the block. But there are actually some other interesting things I'd like to cover on as well. So hopefully, um, for those people who are doing a lot of work in Kubernetes, especially around the security aspects, um, there's a few interesting things that perhaps will be useful and, and let you consider as well. So let's kick it off. Um, the topics I'm going to cover off in my talk are really you know, four different things around containers, around the operating systems that would be typically deploying Kubernetes on top of, um, Kubernetes itself, and sort of the benefits that uh, come as part of uh, working in a team or for you know, enterprises and, and big businesses using Kubernetes. So, Let's quickly kick off with containers. Um, so, you know, when we're building out our containers that are running on top of a Kubernetes environment, I, I guess I don't need to introduce what a container is or what Kubernetes is. Is there anyone who doesn't know what these sorts of things are? Yeah. <laughs> I thought I'd try and catch him out on that one, but no. Um, anyway, so typically what we're doing is if we're building out our containers running on top of a Kubernetes environment, we're trying to keep these things as small as possible. So, you know, containers are minimal. Um, typically running a single process, keeping the code small, you know, reducing the chances of vulnerabilities actually that what we're deploying. Um, they're very much task specific, so predefined operations, the application we know about, um, the ports are typically set up front, the volumes that are being attached to them, you know, really lets us have a stable environment that we can have things like anomaly detection being built around it, which I'll go into a little bit more detail later. Um, they are isolated. Obviously, that's kind of the whole point of what a container is, is that it provides some semblance of isolation. Um, now, there's always a discussion about VM versus containers versus all the various different other isolation mechanisms that are coming out there. Um, but, you know, what we're talking about here, at least in containers for now, is C groups and namespaces. Um, and, of course, reproducible. So these things can be built again and again and again and updated with you know, latest patches without necessarily affecting other parts of the operation. So, you know, these are the basics, you know, what we're looking at around containers to build a, you know, um, a you know, secure pipeline, secure uh, packaging that's delivering the applications and the services into our Kubernetes environments. So, a quick question and a quick get of, you know, raise of hands is how many people think that virtual machines are more secure than containers? Okay, how many people think that containers are more secure than virtual machines? Well, oh, this is interesting. We've actually got more hands for containers than virtual machines. So the real answer is, well, maybe. Um, I'll go into a little bit more detail about you know, why it's not so cut and dried. So you know, there's a really interesting blog post that uh, was written uh, in 2018 by a uh, guy from IBM, James Bottomley, talking about how to measure containers and virtual machine security. It was really quite fascinating. Got uh, you know, got some interesting discussion around the Kubernetes community. I don't know. Did anyone actually see the blog post that came out about uh, uh, the work that he's doing? Good. So I can go into a little bit more detail. <laughs> so he came up with the idea of what are called uh, vertical and horizontal attack profiles. So. If you think about the environments that we're running uh, our code typically, you know, we have a few different aspects. We have what is typically what is seen as the vertical attack profile. That's the stuff that you know, the app developers are responsible. Um, it's all of the code that's traversed to deliver a service from the front end to the database, the kernel, that sort of area. Um, and it's typically the domain of a tenant in a cloud service. So it's not the typical, it's 
The domain of the cloud provider is typically alongside of the uh, horizontal attack profile. Um, it's the area of things like the hypervisor, the kernels, the container runtimes, that sort of thing. Um, and the cloud providers and the operations teams are you know, looking after that in the environment. So on this side of things, the vertical attack profile, the VAP, you know, more code increases the risk of exploitable vulnerabilities. Makes sense, right? On the other side, more code you know, increases the risk of breakouts and containment failures for your hypervisors or for your containers. Um, so uh, James came up with a very interesting you know, calculation, at least for HAP, not quite as easy for that, because there's a lot of code, but the density of kernel bugs by the number of syscalls made is really the horizontal attack profile for um, a particular environment that we're working with. So let's go into a few details about what that is. So, you know, the easiest way to look at it is bare metal. So, you know, it's the simplest thing that we're used to. We have a physical server, you know, two next to each other sitting in a rack. It's fairly typical or fairly difficult to jump. Sorry, it's just got a laser, it does, doesn't it? There we go. Yep. So, you know, it's fairly difficult to jump back and forth between the hardware and the in a physical data center. There are ways, but you know, for the most part, these things are independent stacks. So the tenant manages this vertical attack profile here. Their application at the top with all their code, that's a bit of middleware, some libraries, you know, running down to the kernel, and then uh, any kind of bits and pieces that are exposed these days with IPMI and you know, um, security issues that are leaking around there. So on the, the VAP profile is fairly large. Um, but on the HAP profile, you know, since the hardware is air gapped, you know, it's, it's very, very minimal. This is our base. This is what we're kind of working up. It can't get much lower than this for, for what we're looking at. So now if you look at a shared environment, this is the good old days, you know, that we're looking at where, you know, you might be having two different applications running on a single server. Um, there's no isolation necessarily for containers. We kind of moved on from this way with, you know, shared virtual machines or shared hosting environments with, uh, you know, vhost or, or any of the other ones that you could typically think of. Now, this is the worst possible option. Um, you know, there's no isolation going on here. An application vulnerability can, you know, mean that it both goes down the stack all the way to the kernel, but also can jump across into applications running on the same machine. Um, significantly higher VAP, both the middleware and the libraries are exposed, um, and a significantly higher HAP. So it's a single kernel with no isolation whatsoever. Jumping for virtual machines, so that's what we're most familiar with um, in cloud provider environments, in our on-prem you know, cloud environments too. You know, we still have this stack, which actually looks surprisingly long. You know, we have applications running all the way down to a guest kernel, then we have the virtual hardware um, sitting down to the hypervisor, and obviously then there's probably a kernel in there as well, um, all the way down to the hardware. So it's interesting to see that the VAP is actually higher than bare metal, obviously. Um, we've got double the kernels, we've got bits and pieces of virtual hardware that sit in between the stack there. So the HAP here is actually higher because you've got a hypervisor sitting back and forth in there as well. So you know we're looking at that. Um, and building on top of that stack, we have containers. So we're kind of not assuming that we're running a container in a virtual machine in a cloud provider. It does kind of follow the same in some cases, but uh, in this sense, you know, the VAP is almost identical to uh, bare metal for virtual machines. Uh, sorry, for uh, the VAP is almost identical bare metal in the tenant's case. So application middleware libraries. The kernel itself is again responsible you know, and is shared across the different in uh, you know uh, host itself, um, but there is the isolation that you're looking at with the containers themselves. On the other hand, the uh, horizontal attack profile is much much higher. You've got ten times more syscalls, um, but if you do start implementing sandboxing with things like setcom and um, you know, various different uh, uh, secure kernel options there as well, um, you can. Uh, reduce that quite significantly. So, if anyone knows Jessie Fazell, she is um, a very well known and very well respected member of the uh, at least Docker, Kubernetes, and now GitHub communities. Um, but she's done a lot of work on containers. She is uh, 
pretty crazy in running a lot of her uh, workstation running inside of containers. Um, but she um, has written a really very good blog post on talking about uh, containers and security. Um, and so when she saw the work that James came out in terms of the BOPs and HAPs, um, you know, she said it makes a very you know, compelling um, argument for having a you know, um, you know, security that is actually kind of about the same between a virtual machine and a, and a hypervisor. Sorry, a container and a hypervisor. So the controversial conclusion coming from that, this came from, comes from James's uh, blog, is that containers are by far the most secure virtualization technology from the tenant perspective. The HAP is higher, but it's responsible for the infrastructure provider to mitigate and patch. Virtual machines is the same deal. Issues, you need to be patching it. Containers, you need to be patching it. You need to be maintaining machines. That's the reality of the situation these days. Um, so it's quite interesting, and it didn't really cover um, much about it in the initial blog post talking about DAPs and HAPs, but um, there's a new breed of technologies coming out around different containment methods. Um, James had a little bit of an interest because he was working on a technology called Nubla, which is IBM's uh, container uh, runtime. Um, Gvisor is another one that uh, Google's been working on uh, for secure isolation. And for anyone who's been following Amazon, Firecracker came out a few months ago as well. Um, interestingly, he also did some really, um, uh, yeah, he actually put a few numbers behind this. So you can see both um, the attack profiles to compare it against these things. So I would recommend if anyone's curious, have a look at the blog, have a read. Um, there's some really interesting stuff going on there as well. So um, any questions on that one before I continue on to a more Kubernetes related things? No? OK. So digging into the operating system very, very quickly. You know, the operating systems that we typically have used in the past, RHEL, uh, Ubuntu, any of the uh, you know, standard uh, server operating systems, typically have a fairly large attack profile that's not necessarily optimized for containers. Um, so you know, recently, and in the last few years, a number of uh, container, dedicated container operating systems have uh, made their way out. Obviously, CoreOS is the big one, now owned by Red Hat. Um, Rancher, um, and a few other ones that don't get it used as much, I suppose, these days. Um, the important thing is that things around, say, immutable operating systems, read-only file systems to reduce the risk of malware getting affecting the machines, um, and the idea of replacing operating systems uh, for upgrades and errors. For anyone who's used uh, Google Cloud and seen how they do their automatic node upgrades and automatic node repairs, um, it's a really, really compelling way to not have to worry about your systems getting infected, having problems, reinstall them, nuke them, and uh, have this immutable operating system that you can uh, reduce the risk of security vulnerabilities. Um, obviously, for anything that you are running, be it a container operating system or a standard uh, server-based operating system, things around you know, auditing the Docker and the container runtimes to make sure that they are configured correctly and not exposing particular sockets or ports. Uh, things like Docker Bench, uh, Kubebench, any of the uh, various different tools out there to actually make sure that these things are actually configured and set up correctly. Fairly controversial one is the idea of disabling SSH access. If we have our metrics being exported out, if we have our logs being sent out to a uh, aggregator, Elasticsearch, or various different things, um, the idea of being able to do you know new can environment when something goes wrong, or when there's a risk of vulnerabilities in there, um, you know can mean you know taking away a fairly obvious point of uh, access and um, you know, uh, you know risk of of uh, various different uh, vulnerabilities coming through. So it's fairly controversial. Uh, there was very big debate that went on on Twitter a few months ago about you know, is it better to keep SSH open because just in case there's something that isn't actually collected by your logs um, versus do you keep it tight and secure. But um, I'm not going to go into that debate. And, uh, if you want, you can certainly uh, talk amongst yourselves. So let's get on to Kubernetes because this is kind of what we're here for, right? Um, you know, the threat models that we're looking at typically in a Kubernetes environment um, 
obviously external attackers. We heard about things around, say, Tesla getting hacked. Um, you know, application and container compromises, both on the BAP and the HAP that I just talked about. And the, you know, the very typical compromised uses of credentials, so people walking in the front door with the key. Um, so, you know, typically in Kubernetes, this is a, probably a fairly familiar diagram for anyone who's actually using it. Um, the idea of the isolation really comes down the containers themselves that we have, um, the pods really keeping together things around pod security policies, the isolation and the refinement that comes when they're actually deployed into an environment. Um, the namespaces that can keep, uh, say, tenancy together, even if it's sort of soft multi-tenancy, but alongside of that, using things around, say, network policies and control on the network. Uh, the physical node itself, um, and then the cluster as well. So, um, sort of various different uh, isolation mechanisms expanding out from the container itself. So, you know, here we have the segregation that comes as part of that. Um, on the namespace level, you know, visibility access is critical with things around RBAC, quotas to avoid denial of service, and uh, secrets themselves. Obviously, there are various different ways that you should be managing your secrets in the best way, um, be it encryption on disk, be it vault. You know, the standard configuration for secrets in Kubernetes is okay, but it is not really that secure. Um, on the node level, um, being, you know, putting particular workloads using uh, affinity and taint on particular nodes to make sure that there can be certain things around isolation. If you do need strong multi-tenancy, keeping your nodes in a single cluster separated between uh, different environments can make a, make a difference in that. And at the pod level, so limited communication, again, network policies, service meshes to a certain extent, uh, these sorts of things that are really enabling uh, Know, uh, control not just for the composites themselves but actually reaching out into the network as well. So access control is obviously a really fundamental part. Uh, authentication obviously being the first part of uh, any sorts of things in there. Um, obviously uh, you know the access for humans, the people who are actually working in the clusters with Kube Cuddle or Kube Cuddle or Kube Control or whatever you want to talk about it. Um, you know, delegated out from uh, you know the standards, uh, you know, Kube PKI into things around LDAP or OIDC or various different uh, uh, account management uh, systems, and the apps themselves. So, um, you know, controlling how um, various different server service accounts are controlled around RBAC um, and the various different tooling. So, authorization then comes as part of that, both for the humans and for the applications themselves. Um, making sure that we are limiting what can be done by who in a cluster. Um, the access themselves um, you know, are really you know, provided and limited through uh, various different access points, making sure that um, TLS is enabled, fairly obvious, but a really critical part of it. Um, making sure that various different endpoints are not exposed to the public internet, various different ports that may have been around for legacy environments kind of stick around. So, you know, the uh, C advisor ports that, you know, are now kind of changing to be, you know, either disabled by default uh, or metrics that are being exposed internally in the cluster environments. Um, and finally, enabling audit, you know, making sure that anything that is actually done on the cluster is tracked put out into a you know, log aggregation system or a CM or um, something that's actually going to make sure that what's going on isn't in fact the right, you know, the right thing. Um, and from those sorts of things, it's really quite interesting to see that you know, from the audit logs, you know, RBAC rules can be then fed back into here to limit the scope even further. So some interesting tools out there to do those sorts of things. Image security. Um, obviously, we talked a little bit about containers earlier on. Um, you know, vulnerability scanning is obviously such a critical part these days. You're not going to go to the Docker Hub and download something that you don't know what it is unless you make sure that you have, um, you know, scanned it first or build it yourself, making sure that you know you trust it uh, as part of that. Um, there are a number of excellent tools out there. Twistlock being one of the people who have come along and sponsored us, but obviously, you know. CoreOS Claire, which has now become a little bit more open source um, and is bundled in with a lot of other tools out there now. Um, Aquasec, 
um, for scanning package vulnerabilities. <laughs> Alongside of that, another, you know, a number of these tools will actually do policy-based scanning based on things like NISC and Nipper and, and things too. So, scanning images um, as much as you can, as where you know, as anywhere you can is kind of the rule. You know, scan it in the registries that you're working on, making sure that it's up to date before it's deployed. Um, in the CI pipelines before something actually gets deployed out there as well. Um, and then also as your containers are running, making sure that what you're actually in production is not sitting there with uh, gaping vulnerabilities that could be uh, pulled out at any point in time. The nice thing about containers, obviously immutable images mean that a security update is typically a rebuild away, and if you're doing everything right with your CI CD pipelines, it should be a simple matter of rebuilding and pushing it through the pipeline and back out again as well. Not always as simple when there's policies and, and anything else, but you know that's the goal of trying to get this thing as fun, done as you know um, as agile and as quickly as possible. Um, Kubernetes admission controllers are a really really important part of uh, making sure that we're not deploying these things that can be potentially vulnerable. Um, Graphios is a fantastic tool. Does anyone know Graphios? No, great. Um, it's a tool that actually came out of Google amongst you know, all the other things that are Kubernetes related. Um, they actually built out something that is you know, really designed to handle what they call the software supply chain, but it's really just a way of handling metadata and feeding it into Kubernetes to make sure that the, the admission controller will reject anything that is not uh, checked and certified. So, you know, you know, if somebody checks in some new code for a component, um, it gets checked. So the authorship and the provenance is recorded. So, you know, this is like your PGP keys for GitHub when you're submitting code. Um, that gets pushed into Graphios. The build itself gets pushed in there, so then it gets verified and an image, um, you know, uh, uh, key is put in there too. Um, stamped and making sure that it's verified. Again, stored into the metadata uh, repository. Uh, or tests are passed. Again, it gets signed off, put back into something Graphios again. Code gets deployed, does it meet the security policy? Yes. And uh, so when it hits Kubernetes with the admission controller, that can then check to make sure that everything is okay. All of these bits and pieces here have passed and are green. Um, again, you can also then look at the various different parts that are get, again, code gets deployed out there, gets recorded back into the metadata attestation. And again, yeah, CIA, the you know, various different security teams or CIOs can make sure that then it's all compliant. Now, this is sounds a little bit like enterprise magic. Um, there are a number of tools that do this as well, commercial ones, but this is something that Google is releasing open source, um, first to their cloud servers, but also for Kubernetes environments running outside of that too. But it's an important step of making sure that the various different um, parts of a build pipeline get recorded and tracked and then used as a gating mechanism for when we're deploying code out into our environment. So Graphias is external metadata? <laughs> it is external so, metadata, yes. So it's actually not necessarily Kubernetes related. Um, as the diagram here has, it can actually be for other services, but it makes a lot of sense for Kubernetes. It makes a lot of sense in a CI CD environment. So for anyone who's doing with, working with really strong policy and uh, uh, you know, enterprise environments, this is actually a really interesting so tool. Yeah. So, um, pod security, obviously we're launching our containers, we're running our pods, um, making sure that they are secure in such a way that we're avoiding our breakout, making sure that our VAPs um, uh, and HAPs are um, as small as possible. Um, keeping things obviously with a known origin, we're not pulling random images from Docker Hub, we're doing our vulnerability scanning on it if we do. Um, least privileged to make, run the workload, so making sure that we are reducing the scope of SecCom, um, all the various different uh, ways of reducing what we're launching, and mounting minimal host volumes. Obviously it's probably risky to be launching or putting code, uh, putting data on the host itself. There are obviously use cases for it, but keeping it to a minimum to make sure that those can't be used for breaking out into uh, jumping across containers and things on a particular host. But security policies and security contexts are really quite important for that, um, both for the administrators making sure that they're setting up what is 
done, but also the developers who are launching their application. So setting up mandatory ex uh, access control, the set comps, the SC Linuxes, uh, disabling root and privilege escalation, and uh, making sure that they're using read-only file systems. Now that's not always possible, but it is a really important part to set these things up as policy and as process for anyone who's actually deploying pods into an environment. So, uh, network policy is another really critical part. Um, obviously, we don't want our containers to be running a monk on the network. Um, is a way of you know setting up a you know really nice granular firewall between apps and services. Um, you know, it gives a lot more control and, you know, than what we're typically used to in a tiered environment with firewalling. Um, but it gives the control back to the application developers, the operators. Um, but it gives a way of having um, you know. Ops teams and auditors can see actually how things are being implemented, making sure that you know when you're coming in with an, uh, an access control, um, sorry, an admission controller in Kubernetes, um, that these things can be checked to make sure that they also fit with policy. So, um, is anyone familiar with um, open um, open policy agent? Yes, OPA. We've got a few, so um, it escaped me now because it's a fairly obscure um, tool that is now part of CNCF though. Um, it is essentially a language for defining policy. Um, it uses JSON um, and it allows um, a various different rules to be set up for um, a number of different areas, both either Kubernetes, SSH, various different backends. Um, that can use that for an admission controller in Kubernetes to check um, if things are actually in policy when you're actually inserting the YAML into a Kubernetes environment. One way of doing it. Now, uh, Microsoft recently just contributed an admission controller tool called Policy Controller, I think, and um, becomes a really important way of making sure that you know we're gating stuff as it actually comes into a Kubernetes environment with a fairly consistent language that can be used across a number of different environments. Um, alongside of that, although network policy is really the fundamental piece for making sure that you know we're we're good uh, good network citizens and we're not letting um, various different malware and, and hackers jump around our networks, service meshes are another part that can take uh, security further, uh, giving more uh, identity in the network, setting up TLS uh, between different environments, um, giving more visibility and monitoring into the network environment itself. Um, but also providing more advanced ingress and egress filtering. So from the network policies where we're looking at kind of level you know, L3, L4, we're moving down to kind of the level of L7 so we can actually start doing filtering based on URLs or making sure that everything that actually goes out of our environment is using HTTPS, those sort of things that uh, can be quite useful there too. Um, Obviously, you know, the nice thing that's starting to really come about when we've got things around let's encrypt or vault certificates is making sure that we're actually having automatic certificates generated for our workloads as they are put into place and actually you know, talking to the outside world or speaking or providing services for anyone exposed out there as well. Um, lots of different ingress controllers that will be doing let's encrypt. Um, it's a little bit mind-boggling as to which one to pick. So. Um, I'm sure there's a discussion or a talk unto itself in that one as well. So, um, for those who aren't familiar with Istio, this is a nice little diagram that kind of explains a little bit about what it does. Um, we've had a few talks in it in the past, so is anyone not familiar with Istio? Okay, good. Um, anyway, Istio is a what they call a service mesh. Um, it's a way of providing proxying between various different workloads in an environment. Um, you know, the nice example that they use from the documentation is really sorts of uh, you know, providing both ingress into the network. So this replaces um, the, or it, it's used in addition to the Kubernetes ingress controller. It provides a SSL termination. Um, the pods themselves can be utilized with labels to provide um, more advanced load balancing and traffic between the different, uh, different pods. Um, but it goes down instead of what we typically know with Kubernetes services, where you can say, well, you know, I have uh, you know, a, a mixture of pods running in a particular uh, environment for doing my load balancing, or a particular label that's being used for uh, load balancing control. 
Istio kind of takes it to the next level of being able to do things, say, around user agents or um, uh, particular strings coming in there. So you could target mobile applications versus web applications, um, or doing various different uh, red green blue deployment, red green deployments, no blue in there. Um, um, and more importantly, I think, is really setting up uh, network identity between different workloads, setting up transparent TLS between different environments to provide better security, making sure that this uh, pod itself is talking to the correct database pod in the back end. And finally, things around, say, egress filtering, as I mentioned, making sure that if uh, you know, this, back end, this query back end is only querying HTTPS Google.com versus going out there and trying to hit Google.com or hitting you know, fake Google.com. So it gives a little bit more control in that regard. Um, and uh, you know, um, it's complicated, but it does provide some fairly strong primitives um, for building out a very strong network environment. So you know, it also gives you some really nice visualizations into network traffic and seeing what's going on. Uh, this is a, uh, a project called Vistio. Um, there are probably now about half a dozen various different dashboards out there for seeing what's going on in terms of you know, interesting traffic inside of uh, uh, Istio. So, runtime security. So, um, you know, we have our pods running. How do we know what's actually going on inside of it? So, you know, in the in you know old school world, we have an antivirus, we have uh, you know uh, malware monitoring, various different tools there. But it doesn't quite work in container land. It does, you know, and, and companies are trying to adapt. But you know, it's very important since containers are task specific. It can be a lot easier to detect anomalies. Now, obviously. You know, there are exceptions to that rule, but in the most part, you can really see what's happening inside these namespaces, um, and you know, keeping track of things, say, like a shell being spawned in a container, directories or paths that uh, are being accessed or written. So if you have an immutable image, you shouldn't be actually writing to the disk while you're running it. There are some cases, but these things are fairly scoped and contained. You know what's actually going on. Uh, binaries that should be running in time, you know, we're launching only one process in a container. Anything else that's running shouldn't actually be there. Um, and external services that should be contacted. Um, so there are some really interesting tools. Falco is one of them. It is also now just been um, uh, sandboxed or incubated at CNCF. Um, but it actually tracks to see what's going on inside containers. It sends out logs to Elasticsearch or other CMs to, um, you know, help uh, security teams keep on top of what's going on there. And then workflows can be triggered on that. So they had a really good example in their blog. Falco comes from a company called Sysdig, if anyone knows them, um, where they actually built out a completely open source pipeline for keeping tabs on what actually goes on inside containers in a Kubernetes environment. So you know, from a container environment, um, Falco itself will be running on each host. Um, it installs a little bit of a kernel um, uh, extension, I think, or now it actually uses BPF um, as a way of not having to necessarily patch too much. Um, and it actually keeps an eye on what's going on inside a container. So it will keep, it has a set of rules, keeps tabs on what those rules are, and when a rule is particularly is, uh, you know, triggered, um, or events that are actually coming out of the Kubernetes, say, order controller, can get fed into a NATS topic, um, and then, you know, a serverless function can you know, send it off into, um, into say, Slack for alerting teams, but also you know, killing off the event in pod relaunching it so that any kind of potential vulnerability that was triggered there could be then taken out of as quickly as possible. So, yeah, interesting to see that open source tools are really um, providing an option there that can be utilized for keeping on top of the behavior inside of containers. Secrets, I quickly touched on that before. Um, obviously, environment variables are not a secure method for putting secrets in containers. Uh, volume mounting is obviously the preferred option because it sits inside a tempfs. Um, but for the most part, secrets out of the box in Kubernetes aren't particularly secure, um, despite their name secrets, um, because they're not encrypted in the data store. Um, setting up encryption at rest, which is now part of Kubernetes, uh, but not enabled by default, or integrating things like Vault are a really, really important part of running any kind of production environment. So, quickly on the user environment, there's user benefits. Um, for cluster operators, we're looking at you know, a smaller attack surface and faster updates using something like a container operating system. 
um, a standardized platform for running applications and services. We all have a common language that we can talk about. As an operator, I can talk about what a pod is, I can talk about a node. As a developer, I can also talk about the same sorts of things. We have a common language. Um, but we can also get some audit and control over the user access and the workloads that are being put onto these different environments. For developers, um, we get a you know we get YAML, we get a common delivery format with containers that is easily reproducible and easily deployable. Um, you know, we get a greater control over both the network and the application security that is handed to the developers, but is provided in such a way that can be you know used by operators, by audit teams to actually have. Uh, visibility into a full environment. You know, this is the GitOps. This is the stuff that gets put into source control that everyone can actually get visibility and can see what's going on there. Vulnerability scanning during development and during runtime, making sure that we have uh, a good way of uh, keeping tabs on that both during deployment and during uh, the operation, and real-time visibility to things like intrusion with things like Falcon. For the network operators, again, you know. Being able to see the YAML files that really produce, um, you know, the communication between our pods, uh, the Istio um, CRDs that go in there that we can actually um, have it as a way of auditing and um, containing, it, you know, the network environments. But it means it also is a way of collaborating between the developers, the network ops team. So. Um, a way of sharing that and a way of putting that into a you know, area that's visibility. Um, you know, the death of SDN, you know, in my previous companies, you know, we, we joked that SDN was actually spreadsheet defined networking. Uh, for any of those people who are still looking after the spreadsheet containing IP addresses, gone are the days of actually having to look after and hand out IP addresses on that sort of time. That's the nice thing about Kubernetes and, and the security that it provides in some ways. Um, automatic encryption and identity between applications reduces the chance of developers forgetting to slip in a certificate between different environments, different services, different tiers. Um, and detailed monitoring. Going beyond packet capture, going into things like protocol, uh, you know, protocols um, and moving up the stack into the visibility that we can see with things like Istio. Security and order teams, um, you know, we get these things, you know, visibility to the present state of environments, um, again, source controlled and declarative configurations what has been put into production should in fact be what you see in the YAML files that are stored in the source control. Um, the idea of GitOps lets you kind of diff that and make sure that there's any, you know, if there's any divergence, we can bring them back into line. Um, you know, API driven, um, automate that compliance instead of you know, handing out a you know, thousand row spreadsheet again. Um, audit logging for you know, make any kind of changes that go into here. And again, real time visibility into intrusion or unusual. Uh, behaviors and containers. So in summary, from all of the stuff that I've covered up there, um, it's an amazing secure future with Kubernetes. Um, you know, everyone gets unicorns and ice cream for breakfast, you know, all of that kind of stuff. It's not quite that, you know. There are, it's, you know, Kubernetes itself, as we all probably know, is, it's a collection of tools. It's not a product unless you are using something like OpenShift or the other distributions. And then you end up getting locked into a particular workflow in that environment. Kubernetes itself, it has the basics, but it does need a lot of configuration. It does need a team to keep an eye on it. And that's why you don't necessarily need to get rid of an ops team when you do have it. Um, uh, Kubernetes environment. And again, it's also very fast changing. You know, new chain, uh, new tools are coming out, changing very rapidly. Um, and in some ways, it's difficult for commercial offerings to keep up as well. But on the flip side of that, this presentation I originally put together halfway through last year. I mean, updating it for tonight and, and cleaning it up a little bit, not a lot has changed. The basics are really still fundamental. They make a lot of sense. They are really in place for you know, the various different aspects of you know, keeping a secure Kubernetes environment. It hasn't changed that much. Um, and the tools are only getting more mature as they, as they continue. So, um, questions? Yes. I have one question regarding the uh, VMVS container security. Yes. Which one? Which way is more secure to me if I uh, run my workloads in VM together with my bad neighbor, or run workloads in containers together with my neighbor? Which way is more secure? So, again, it, it, in some ways, it depends on 
which environment you're running. If you're running it in a multi-tenancy environment. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Um, if your operators, if the guys who are keeping on top of both the um, container runtimes and the uh, VMs themselves are making sure that everything is kept up to date and patched, um, then, and made sure that, you know, set comps in place, then you should, in fact, be reasonably secure. You're probably about the same with a virtual machine or a container. Um, obviously, there are always vulnerabilities. Kernel is an incredibly large service area for attack. There's always things that we may not necessarily know about that will pop up that could be zero days or anything else. So, again, um, I would say that if it's set up correctly, um, then it is pretty equivalent. If you are running something that you're running, you know, managing yourself, if you're running a virtual machine environment, it's more than likely that you probably are a little bit more secure, only because you still need to then go to your, um, you know, container environment, make sure that it's locked down. Your, you know, SecCon profiles, your uh, policy, your port security policies are all in place, and making sure that they're all set up correctly as well. So, um, again, it's always it depends. But I prefer a kernel level isolation, like. For a networking, uh, a physically isolate, isolated uh, uh, network is more secure than soft isolated, uh, yep. like by using network policies. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if it, if security is really that critical, then you probably need to look at running on bare metal and completely isolated. <laughs> there's 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 no there's no magic bullet. I think you know there are you know um, there's Kernel vulnerabilities. There's container breakouts. There's virtual machine um, breakouts and you know, potential vulnerabilities too. So you know, it's just a matter of keeping on top of that. There's no silver bullet. Thank you. Anyone else? How are we for time? <laughs> Sorry, Vincent. I'm going to cut you off. <laughs>